The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, we're seeing the bombs fly right now in Israel. I know you were in Israel just last year, but these wars these days seem to be fought without large armies and without actual front lines. You know, you've got bombs being lobbed in the very homeland from the people where, you know, they're coming right from residential areas. You know, we've got Hamas, we've got Hezbollah, we've got the Muslim Brotherhood to the south. It's it's so hard now to distinguish because we're not necessarily talking about countries. We're talking about small groups fighting each other. You know, when I was in Israel, we spent some time in Jerusalem and uh, an afternoon actually with Martin Van Kreveld, who is um, there in Jerusalem in one of the settlements just outside, and he's based there, teaches at Hebrew University. He's a military historian. It's been suggested by many of his colleagues that he's perhaps one of the greatest military historians uh, in, in the last hundred years, and maybe even beyond that. But, you know, there is this idea that warfare, in one of his books, one of his books written in the 90s, actually, that warfare is returning to sort of an earlier iteration. The state as we know it, the state as we know it is a fairly modern convention, and state warfare along with it is also very sort of modern, dating to the 1600s uh, and the signing of the Treaty of Westphalia. And following that period, conflict was controlled more and more by a professional, by a state-run military. And that era of direct conflict in Van Kreveld's view is now changing. We have terrorism, we have regional conflicts, we have warlords, we have drug cartels, we have smaller-scale conflicts which are based on ideology, based on turf fights, based on other issues that, frankly, dominated the scene and were sort of the picture of conflicts prior to 1648, and they seem to be returning. Well, you know, David, in this day and age, you know, it used to be, look at the James Bond films back from the old days. It was Russia and it was America. You had giant superpower fighting giant superpower. You know, maybe it was espionage, maybe it was nuclear, but nonetheless, they were nameable state entities. And at this point, you just have to continually read the Jerusalem Post, Al Jazeera, New York Times, just to keep up with the various groups. It's hard now because the enemies are showing far more ambiguity, are they not? Well, exactly. Naming the enemy, facing the enemy, defeating the enemy. These are goals which now have much more inherent ambiguity. And the direct conflict between superpowers is far less likely in the decades ahead, at least, you know, in that sort of traditional mode of conventional conflict. From the incredible analysis, we glean sort of a number of things, including that the weapons of choice in future wars are not necessarily nuclear or otherwise conventional, but they require the mindset of a guerrilla fighter to undermine, destabilize, shift the balance as in jujitsu, and, and gain advantages by hitting where they least expect it. You, you can recall Jonas Savimbi. Oh, sure. He was a man who was an avowed communist, trained for years in Maoist guerrilla warfare with the Chinese in the 1960s before disavowing communist ideas in the mid-70s and then leading a civil war against the Soviet-supported MPLA in Angola. From 1974 to 2002, when he died, UNITA, the fighting force led by Savimbi, continued in that sort of conflict that Ben Krevel described. And so, you know, whether it is civil wars in Africa or Asia or the rising trend of religious-inspired terror throughout the world, we have non-conventional warfare, which is appearing and appears to be with us and in, in, in here to stay, really. David, wouldn't you say that al-Qaeda is just one of the few names that we can actually point out and say, well, maybe this is an enemy? Well, if you wanted to put a face to it, bin Laden is probably the closest we come to putting a face to the enemy. If fighting and winning is for us today the same sort of challenge I think the British faced over 200 years ago, when the colonists simply wouldn't stand still in an orderly line and wait to get shot at by that overwhelming host of redcoats. Today, you know, certainly technology gives us an advantage. Without technology as an edge, we might have to revert to techniques and strategies and the sheer numbers that the British relied on so heavily. 
Well, so war is changing, according to Van Kribbel. But, you know, David, it's not just countries and it's not just small groups or states. It's uh, not necessarily these religious groups that are always the enemy. You know, corporations themselves right now, it's hard to define their borders. You know, it's not just an American corporation these days or a European corporation that's investing worldwide and actually using many currencies and many different types of uh, financial mechanisms. Well, we've had multinational corporations for decades, even during the Cold War, but there is something that is very unique since the end of the Cold War. Multinational corporations, which are really stateless or apolitical entities, along with state-sponsored enterprises. You know, those are the companies that are owned and controlled by various governments. So in Russia, you've got Gazprom. In China, you've got Sinopec. And then lastly, sovereign wealth funds. These are the organizations that are operating international businesses according to a set of rules, which have also changed. So, David, the way we would normally see a corporation is just trying to capture market share. You know, McDonald's competing against Burger King, market share. But what you're saying is these state-owned corporations or these multinational corporations that have other goals may actually be cornering strategic types of investments, commodities. They may be manipulating things in markets for other reasons than just capturing normal traditional market share. Well, and this is where business and politics is creating ambiguity once again. Yeah, capturing market share, that is the normal evolution of a business enterprise. But now you have enterprises that are capturing more than market share. As you say, strategic mineral reserves or software that provides crippling edge to the competition. Now, who's the competition? Is it a corporation or is it another country? Again, when you're talking about state-owned enterprises and corporate growth, What exactly defines corporate growth and the boundaries of corporate growth when you're really talking about the government behind it that has intentions and a program in play? Technology, in the form of hardware and software, these are both weapons that can be used by state and non-state actors alike. We used to fight wars for natural resources. We fought to control natural resources. Now we ask corporate executives in a boardroom to buy those interests and consolidate them into a balance sheet, which is often supported by cheap credit or some other such subsidy. And of course, there's others that might decry that as an unfair advantage. But frankly, everyone is doing that. And like we said, China has Sinopec. France has EADS, the aircraft and arms manufacturer. Russia has Gazprom. The U.S. has GE and Citigroup. These are all corporations which receive direct and indirect support from the government. They're truly corporations, but they're also truly enmeshed with political ends. They're unfortunately corporatist, or dare we say fascist. And it's today a universal game. It's not just one country where you see this happening. Well, and David, this reminds me a little bit of what we've seen over the last couple of years between Israel and Iran. You know, you've got corporations that are manufacturing Well, you know, equipment that enriches uranium, yet the software was tainted somehow. The espionage was tainted so that that equipment would actually have a virus right at the critical moment. And and we've seen that this is another form of warfare. Well, and again, this is where the lines are blurred, the lines between corporate espionage and espionage in general. You look at who makes up a multinational corporation today. These multicultural teams bring the requisite cultural, linguistic, and professional expertise to a very effective management program for a global organization. Yet these are citizens of the world. They're very cosmopolitan. They're open-minded. And yet we have these conflicts between companies that are sponsored by states, sovereign wealth funds, which have a very specific role investing towards the interests of the state and multinationals, again, these sort of stateless, apolitical organizations. And so when you take a secret from one group, who are you taking it for? Who does it benefit? And are you a citizen of the world or are you a citizen of your own country? This is, again, where we live in ambiguity. We are today reflecting on the possible vulnerabilities open up in sort of this postmodern age. And I think it's important that we remember the nature of mankind. We might find a naive mindset as a vulnerable posture for our or, frankly, for any country. Now, let's pretend that all states are striving for peace on it, for the goodwill towards men. Even if that were the case, and we could assume the best of multinational corporations, of state-owned enterprises, of sovereign wealth funds, you still have the Russian mafia. You've got global crime syndicates dressed, frankly, today to match the profile of an investment banker. You have warring drug lords and drug interests. 
that are fighting and organizing themselves like military forces, banking with HSBC, no less, and other banks, and coming into and out of our country with relative ease. We live in a very interesting age where conflict, whether it's economic, financial, or actually military, is, as Ben Preble suggested, not just oriented to the state and the military. Well, and David, I think you were talking about a naive mindset. And yes, we would all love to have peace on earth. You know, I, I think about the naivety of the, you know, the bumper sticker that you see that says coexist and it has all these different religious symbols that historically have not gotten along together. But David, there's always a backstory. And unfortunately, man's nature is not necessarily always good natured, as we know. And so capturing market share, that may feel like a soft invasion, but it's an invasion nonetheless. Well, yeah, whether it is capturing market share or mergers and acquisitions, gaining vital resources or technology, this is really like a strange time warp. If you go back to the Asian conflict and what we saw during the Vietnam War, the Nell Corp was running a series of legitimate businesses, but as cover-up for CIA operatives in the area. Now, you know, starting a revolution in Central America, this has happened in recent history. We started a revolution in Central America so that certain construction crews could get a contract versus the competition. Well, David, look at the Panama Canal. Exactly. That's how the Panama Canal was built in Panama. It wasn't supposed to be there. Long live the revolution. David, we live in a day and age of technology. And for even those people who are fighting technology or who seem to hate technology, they're actually using it as a weapon right now. Well, right. We've got the Iron Dome, which is sending off rockets. And this is a, a very complex technology that the Israelis are using to defend against the bombardment of rockets. And, you know, again, this is conventional weapons used unconventionally, I say unconventionally because they're launched from civilian areas, and over 1,200 of them have been launched and knocked out. Well, what's interesting, though, is that side by side, you also have a technological attack. Israel, from November 14th to the 18th, has fended off 44 million different computer attacks with only one virus disturbing its system. 44 million attacks in about a five-day period. So, I mean, it runs the gambit, Kevin, from enviral anarchists and radical jihadi groups alike. They see technology, ironically, as a tool with which to cripple the system and return it to a simpler time. So, again, whether it's the conventional warfare or the unconventional warfare, technology is, is an interesting means to that same end. There is that second battle raging at the same time, which can freeze communication systems, destroy the banking sector, and with it, the economy. Well, Dave, you know, the day of having the little toy soldiers, the ones that were painted blue and the ones that were painted red, and, and positioning them around, you know, on the battlefield to pretend that you're working through different strategies, it's far more complex than that at this point. You, you talk about 44 million cyber attacks or viral attacks towards uh, Israel over the last few days. Well, those have had to be fended off because, really, you can't fight a war without technology these days, and you can't have technology without communications and the computers all working. So, it really, it's a change from a military standpoint. Would you say that there are other things that are being used right now in the form of warfare that uh, no one really even senses from, you know, just the old study of uh, battlefield tactics? Absolutely, and I think this is underappreciated, but it is just as critical to the U.S. economic and political viability moving forward is you consider economic and financial warfare. Benjamin Franklin wrote about the attack on America coming from the British in an attempt to destroy the fledgling nation's economy and to cause social unrest. The Continental Currency was issued during the Revolutionary War and was vital for the Continental Congress as a means of financing the war effort. There was a reasonable but not over-issuance of the currency. And Lo and behold, a great inflation broke out anyways. Why? Because of massive counterfeiting on the part of the British. The British were hoping to destroy the support of the war effort by causing economic dislocation and pain that Americans would thus associate with the war effort versus the alternative living at peace with the British. So it's amazing because the British used the same tactic during the French Revolution to further destabilize the powers of the day. The French Revolution, American Revolution, in France they were counterfeiting assignats and adding to inflationary pressures in France. 
Well, and David, it, this is nothing new. I mean, it's gone on obviously for hundreds of years where you try to destroy your enemy with some sort of currency manipulation. But look at what's going on right now. We talked about Iran and Israel, but actually between Iran and the United States, this is not just a, a concern about a nuclear buildup. This is a concern about a currency war. Right. So you can use a currency to either gain a strategic advantage or to destabilize a regime. And we are fighting this fight with Iran as we speak. We're not merely attempting to limit trade with a rogue nation, but we're hitting them where it matters the most. All assets in Iran are priced in real. If you can cause a crippling run away from real, a decrease in purchasing power of 60 percent, 300 percent, it's been radical. If you look at 2012, there has been an absolute financial slaughter in Iran. In a matter of months, we have targeted not only the policy shifts, but ultimately regime change. And it's, it's as if we are living out the British role. We're acting to keep nuclear stability in play. We are acting the British part, and today maintaining dollar stability, U.S. political hegemony, but it is via the destruction of the real. Well, David, you talked about last week, and this was so critical, the faith in a currency is really the only thing, once it's a fiat currency, that gives it any value in the first place. And so when you shatter the faith, that's, of course, when you go into that incredible devaluation of the currency that, that we could also call inflation or hyperinflation. Right. So past tense, currencies have and will continue to be used as weapons. Current tense, they are being used right under our noses, and they're being targeted for their inherent vulnerability. Mind you, it's fiscal chaos. And granted, we've created some of that fiscal chaos in Iran. But if, if you look at home, we have our own out of fiscal chaos. It's fiscal chaos in that environment that is a very good environment into which you can launch an attack on currency because legitimacy and trust are already on the minds of investors, whether that's domestic or international. You're talking about currency holders. And that's a very weak point to hit on. It takes a lot less energy to start an avalanche when the hillside is already loaded with snow. That's the environment the U.S. is in today. We have massive fiscal imbalances, and it doesn't take much if an enemy wanted to press the advantage to create currency instability. You're right. Last week, we discussed the demand dimensions of inflation. That is, when a currency is repudiated, no one wants it anymore. Demand goes away. Getting rid of existing dollars or the other currency, it doesn't have to be the dollar, but any currency unit, it has the same effect. Getting rid of those units has the same effect as printing new ones. So, David, when Milton Friedman said that inflation is a monetary phenomenon, that's not necessarily the case. It may be a supply and demand phenomenon. Well, in this case, we're really talking about psychology being the defining factor in super and hyperinflation. So Friedman was wrong. Inflation is not always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It is, unless it's a psychological phenomenon in which people are getting rid of the stuff. One minute things are fine, and the next, they are not. Well, David, in my lifetime here in the United States, I've never experienced a hyperinflation. So give us an example of what you're thinking right now. Well, and again, this is just a perception change, but let's say, for instance, I have a billion dollars on deposit with J.P. Morgan. Billion with a B. As a deposit, that supply of dollars is not causing inflation. But let's say that I wake up tomorrow and I realize that the Fed has worked effectively in its 99 years of existence. Next year is its 100-year anniversary. They've worked for 99 years to destroy my purchasing power. This is a new realization for me somehow. 95% is gone since 1913. What used to cost $1 now costs $20, and I decide to spend as much of it as I can before the Fed has the privilege of taking my last nickel. In case it's a billion dollars, so it's not just a nickel, but again, in terms of purchasing power. Yeah, right. When I purge the bank account and start buying things, businesses are glad I'm in town spending like a billionaire on a mission. They may realize later that I knew something that they did not know, and that what I've transferred to their account is something with a half life. If they don't get rid of it quickly, it will be worth less when they unload it, and their balance sheet, their bank account, will take the loss. At least I have something material to show for the billion dollars that I just spent. Now, David, what you're talking about is a personal, this is a personal decision to do what you're doing. But actually, is this not mass psychology? It's not me or you necessarily that's creating inflation when we decide to uh, you know, get out of that particular currency. It's when we do it and our neighbor does it and their neighbor does it, and it, it just builds on itself. Right. And 
demand is the variable that reflects mass psychology finding a tipping point. What is the cusp of that? What alters how people view a currency? Official money printing may be the culprit, but a real inflation begins not when money supply is growing exponentially, but when people's confidence in the paper in question and the government backing it is in collapse. As we said last week, when demand works in reverse and all dollars currently in existence come out of account, velocity explodes higher and the game of hot potato begins. You know, this reminds me of the book by Adam Ferguson, Dave, about the 1920s uh, in hyperinflation in Germany. You know, the book When Money Dies, it seems like that's the phenomenon that occurred at that point. It became a mass run to the door. You know, When Money Dies is a story of the German mark being destroyed by a private banker. Recall that Havenstein was a private banker, and he had a bad idea. But more than that, it's a story about a shift in sentiment. Inflation began to boost the value of all things. And what's interesting is that stock investors were pleased by this initially, not realizing that massive money printing was causing a repricing of goods and services, not just their sheer brilliance as investors. Things were getting not more expensive, but I guess the other way of looking at that is paper itself was becoming worth less and less. So it took more money, more paper to buy the same things. The issue in play is, is, is really one of strategy, and this is sort of bringing us full circle. How do we how do we defend our currency? Having the reserve currency status that we have, the U.S. dollar, and leading as the world's largest economy is not something that we get to keep by default. We were once far less powerful, and we can move back to that place again. So number one, we need to continue exploring the idea of a return to a gold standard, putting a bulletproofing around our currency, and thus our economic trajectory here in the U.S. Secondly, we also need to consider the implications of an attack on the U.S. dollar and how we can adequately defend against it. Currency wars are more common than you'd think, and I'm I'm not sure that the Pentagon really understands just how vulnerable their counterparts in D.C. are making us via the debts and deficits that we're accruing. And this is, again, that point of no one will attack the U.S. dollar if it is strong, but if we are in a moment of weakness, it doesn't take as much to push. And if we are in a state of natural imbalance, for us to topple at that particular point. Well, David, this really reminds me back in the 1990s when George Soros benefited by $2 billion betting against the British pound. Now, one could say that that was just a good bet, or one could say that that actually was a form of currency war. You know, when a domino is falling, it doesn't take much to help it go a little faster and a little bit further. The physics of dislocation were in play, and that's what Soros was capitalizing on, was something that was out of balance, out of kilter to begin with. It could not be maintained indefinitely, and it reached that point of natural dislocation, and he was there to bet against it and profit from it. You could argue the same thing will ultimately happen with the Swiss National Bank. The Swiss National Bank are spending a lot of money to intervene in the currency markets and peg the Swiss currency, the franc, to the euro so that they don't lose the trade disadvantage, so that they can continue to sell goods from Switzerland into the larger Europe without being priced out because their currency is getting expensive and thus the goods that they manufacture and export are too expensive for the European marketplace. The European marketplace is far too important to the Swiss. So what are they doing? They are fighting their own fight. They are fighting their own battle, manipulating their own currency lower so that they can keep jobs in play. What happens is quite simple. If you lose a trade advantage, you begin to see factory closures. With factory closures come higher unemployment. With higher unemployment comes political destabilization. So ultimately, politicians look at using currency as a tool to fight their competition not because they want to see companies do that much better, but because they can't afford to have more people enter the ranks of the unemployed. The unemployed represent potential energy. Potential energy, as China has discovered over the last several hundred years, is a powder keg. There has been so many revolutions, so many riots, so many street protests in China over the last 300 years, and even over the last three months, countless. And frankly, guess why we don't hear about them? Because they control the media because they control the media, and that's very important. They don't want that to spread like wildfire. It may anyway, but governments always want to keep people fully employed, fully preoccupied, so that they cannot be unhappy, disaffected, 
and rioting in the streets. David, you talk about unemployment being so important, and of course, all states want to stay in state. They want to be able to stay in power, and I'm including China in this. Okay, we talked about the outgoing China General Secretary Hu Jintao, who you know he's been replaced at this point, but he did have a very critical statement about Chinese currency and the American currency as he was leaving. You know, it was basically that the current international currency system is the product of the past. And there's a growing audience of people who see dollar supremacy and monopoly status as something that has to go. How does that happen? Is it a gradual process? Does it happen all at once? We'll have to find out. But you can already see cracks in that monopoly status emerging over the last 10 years. We've seen the euro appreciate from 0.99, so basically 99 cents compared to the dollar, to 1.59 by July of 2008. And as a reserve asset held by central bank, it's gone from 0% of their total allocation to over 24% of all central bank foreign currency reserves. In the wake of the Great Recession, now we've seen actually the price of the euro drop as much as 30%. And lo and behold, China and other key trade partners have helped stabilize the euro. Declining European purchasing power puts limits on further imports from China, of course, China not wanting to see trade partners' demand for goods change has helped to prop up the currency. So there is this effort to solidify the euro's role in the international monetary regime, open up regional opportunities for the yuan, and ultimately take the dollar down a notch. Maybe it just takes a step back. But the future monetary regime will in most people's opinion, better reflect world trade and the key trade partner relationships and not be so centered on the U.S. dollar. As that happens, what we're seeing is essentially what people have described as a race towards the bottom, competitive currency devaluation. Everyone wants their piece of the export pie. And if they're going to keep that competitive edge, again, politicians look at it as an easy choice. To value the currency, yes, ultimately there may be long-term inflationary effects, but to value the currency today, maintain the competitive advantage in terms of trade and exports, and you keep people employed. Jobs equals political stability. You tell me what a politician cares more about than their own personal legacy and place in policy and in politics. Jobs are paramount. I think we're going to see a lot of that over the next four years here domestically. We have the balance of power shifted from the halls of finance to the halls of politics. And the political agenda we see is set. There's grave currency consequences for that here in the United States. But managing the dollar lower is ultimately going to fly in the face of what Tim Geithner said only a few years ago. We want to see a strong dollar. Now, he said that in the context of the dollar taking about a 10% hit. Was it just a matter of him talking out of both sides of his mouth? Absolutely. They will talk strong dollar language when, in fact, they're doing the exact opposite, waging a war to gain an advantage to employ more people and to return to being manufacturing-oriented, our economy having much more of a manufacturing base. Frankly, I don't think we can get that done. I really don't think we can get that done, even if we destroy the dollar. But that's not going to keep academics and politicians from attempting Well, you know, you talk about academics and politicians. We go back to the 1970s, and David, you and I have both been very critical of the dual mandate of the Fed. And, of course, the mandate for the Fed is to keep inflation low and unemployment low. But we realize that a lot of times the tool to try to gain employment in any country is to print money. And so, you know, I guess if you were a Federal Reserve chairman right now and you had a politician standing over you and, you know, you're probably going to opt for inflation and the destruction of your currency before you opt for high unemployment. And there is this drive by the Fed to create an environment of negative real rates in hopes that they can take bank deposits. We talked about the billion dollars that I theoretically have on account with J.P. Morgan. Trust me, it's only theoretical. It's just an example, pie in the sky. But again, if the Fed can force deposits, whether it's mine, whether it is bank CIOs and CFOs who are sitting on $1.7, $1.8 trillion in cash, if they can drive that money into the economy, they're going to try to do that. And zero interest rate policies and the inflationary policies that they put in play are intended to do just that, punish you for seeking safety. They want you to get out into the marketplace, spend it, invest it, 
do something in the stock market, do anything, but keep it lying dormant on account. All right, well, David, I can't control what's going on in Israel. You can't either. We can't control necessarily the currency wars between China and, and the United States and Europe and, and Iran. One of the things we can do, though, is we can still make active decisions based on this analysis for our own family. And, David, can you offer some suggestions as to what people should be doing right now? Well, again, the game that's being played, and whether you realize that you're a rat in a maze or not, you need to recognize that. The Fed would like to push you into the marketplace. And with savings, with hard-earned dollars, the blood, sweat, and tear, the toil of your work effort and the savings, which, which represent that work effort, the Fed would like you to get out and spend it as a consumer. Go buy consumer electronics. Go buy the new iPad. Go buy anything to stimulate growth in the economy. They need you to prop up aggregate demand because, frankly, they're not doing a very good job. The problem is this. They are trying to create an environment of fear of inflation and get you to go out and spend. What you should be doing is investing in the right places, something that gives you that Teflon coating that as we experience higher rates of inflation, you have protection in your portfolio. That is the legacy of gold. That is the legacy of silver. That is the role that precious metals play, ironically, both in an inflationary environment and particularly gold in a deflationary environment as an asset protector, as an asset preserver, as the the guarantor of purchasing power. Go back to that earlier example. And from 1913 to the present, my $1, now I have to spend 20 to buy the same thing. That's not the case for someone who's owned precious metals. During that whole period of time, 1913 to the present, you've been able to maintain purchasing power. Has it made you wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice? No. No, it's just maintained your purchasing power. An ounce of gold has always bought roughly 300 loaves of bread. It did in 1913, and it does today. Well, David, as a preview of coming attractions, I think we should continue to explore our vulnerabilities, not only with currency wars, but just as the the nature of the state is changing. And, of course, David will have guests on that will add to that conversation. But for today, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y dot com. Or give us a call at 800 525 Nine five five six. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.